So welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we continue with dimensionality reduction, but now look at some nice nonlinear methods. Yeah, so far we started with lots of probabilities being the basis for many of the things that we are doing. And we also s did some matrix differential calculus, which by now I hope you like. We will also see it again today in the lecture, so it's really useful. And um, after support vector machines, where we learned something about optimization, we looked at PCA and kernel PCA. And today we look at nonlinear alternatives for principal component analysis, which try to find like the nonlinear manifold in data somehow. Okay, so that's what we are talking about today. And we will use some optimization and we also will use some matrix differential calculus, maybe also briefly. Okay, let's recall first, so what was the problem of dimensionality reduction? So given some data set, x1 to xn, the goal of dimensionality reduction is to find a low dimensional representation z1 to zn in some lower dimensional space that keeps most of the properties of the higher dimensional data. Okay, so that's the goal. Now, properties that are interesting are, for example, variance, so the spread of the data should be kept, or, and this leads typically to linear methods. And today we will look at different methods which try to keep the neighborhood relationships. So basically, if a point is close by to some other point, that should be the case in the low dimensions as well if it was in the higher dimensions. So we will try to keep neighborhood relationships. <clears throat> Why that might be a good idea, um, let me show you on the board. So um, suppose this is your data set, then the PCA solution would give us two axes because there's a spread in one and in the other direction. However, the data looks inherently one-dimensional, right? So variance might not be the best idea. Now let's say I'm asking, so who's the neighbor of this point? Who are the two neighbors of that point? So those are the two neighbors. And so on and so forth. So if I draw edges between neighboring points, so I'm looking at the two nearest neighbor graph here, so this guy has another neighbor, it will have also z1, and that point will also have z1, okay? Now, an embedding would be a nonlinear embedding, for example, one where I'm keeping the neighborhood relationships. And then, for example, we could get a representation from r to z2, yeah, with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 points. into nice straight line, where the neighborhood relationships are kept, okay? And this method, for example, going from here to here can be also seen like maximizing the variance. Kind of, we have the points and we have little strings between the points, if they are neighbors, and then we drag it as much as possible, okay? And such a method is, for example, called maximum variance unfolding. Yeah, that is the method that we will see at the end, I think very end of the lecture today, a nice method that um, can be solved via semi-definite programming, which is yet another fancy optimization method for mathematics. But before we do that, we look at another data set, and we will look at the so-called Swiss roll data set, which is basically... Um, <coughs> Easiest explained with a sheet of paper. So where is my sheet of paper? So this is my prop, and this, this, this Swiss roll, this cake, looks like this, and then you cut it into pieces, I think. What is it called in German, this cake? Anyone knows? Uh, I don't think Swiss roll. It has some other, whatever. So, and ideally we would say now, so actually this is a, a two-dimensional manifold, and we would like to unfold it. So that is the task. And um, today we will see methods that can do that. So the data is somehow somewhere in some high dimensional space, rotated, whatever, and it will extract this 2D representation. Um, as I said, the neighborhood relationship play a role. So for the neighborhoods, think of a little aunt, yeah, Ameise, sitting here, right? So for the aunt to get from this side to the other side, it has to go along the manifold. 
right? It can only go to neighboring points, and it will have to go a long way. So we will find an embedding such that the arm basically has the same way as it would have on the curved manifold, OK? So that's the, the first algorithm, basically, already. So um, yes, I said that already. There's linear dimensionality reduction when we have a linear subspace, blah, blah, blah. In nonlinear dimensionality reduction, we are looking for a curved subspace, yeah? this curved thingy, like this Swiss roll type of thing. And more generally, we could also say we are looking for a manifold inside R to the D, where with manifold, I now mean the mathematical differential geometry definition of a manifold. So in German, Mannigfaltigkeit, right? Which is some mass object, which is then defined, and then the mathematicians prove stuff about it. The interesting property about it is a manifold is defined as follows. A manifold is some subset of the R to the D that locally looks like some lower dimensional space, like a lower dimensional Euclidean space. So let's take our Swiss roll example. And locally means we have a single point here and a little surrounding around it. And this looks like the R to the 2 locally, right? You could have a tangent space on it. And it's a good approximation to my manifold. However, this is a super simple manifold, which also globally looks like the R to the 2. There are more difficult manifolds, like a cup of coffee, for example. A cup, there are some things with holes and some other weird things, or maybe the surface of a sphere. That's also all manifolds. They are locally like some lower dimensional Euclidean space, but globally they can be very quite complicated objects. And in mathematics, people study these properties of um, more complicated objects. We basically will only encounter in this lecture stuff which is locally looking like the R to Z2, but then also globally looks like the R to Z2, right? So nothing super complicated, no Klein, Klein bottles and stuff like that. OK, so here's the famous Swiss roll. So this is basically some continuous version. And in, in machine learning, we typically have samples from it. So those are like points from the Swiss roll. And um, here they are nicely colored from the inside to the outside, right? So if we map these points onto a 2D space, you can right away see. So this blue stuff is coming from the inside, and the red stuff is coming from the outside. So by using these colorings, it, it helps us to see whether we did a good job or not from unfolding it, OK? So why this might be relevant? Um, let's say you take pictures of a face, OK? That example will come in a couple of slides. So take a video of my face, and now I'm, I'm moving somehow some muscles in my, my face. And I could look like this, or I could smile, or whatever. And this is changing the pixels. Right? So every picture is a 1,000 dimensional vector. And when I'm moving my muscles, I'm continuously moving around in this 1,000 dimensional space. Right? And I have only finitely many muscles in my face. I don't know how many. Let's say eight. I guess that's an underestimation. But if there are only eight muscles, it's probably an eight dimensional submanifold of this 1,000 di dimensional space of the possible images. Of course, here's another dimension. I can move my head left and right, up and down. I can get closer or further away from the camera. Those are three further dimensions. I can combine it with all my facial expressions. And I can also turn around my head. But each of these movements kind of correspond to some trajectory in this high dimensional space. And so you could imagine, even though I might have a megapixel camera here, what it's recorded is coming from a lower dimensional manifold. Okay. Similarly, uh, let's say the MLIS digit data set with twos and sevens, for example, you could also imagine that all twos are somehow living on some submanifold of the whole space. Okay? And the sevens are on some other submanifold of the whole space. So it, it would be interesting to study that. Or yet another example, suppose you're doing measurements of, let's say, astrophysics, you are measuring the light of some star and um, getting the spectrum. So that might be a 1,000 dimensional vector. But there might be some physics behind how these spectra are generated, right? Some, also some turning knobs, like the muscles in my face. So actually, even though the data looks 1,000 dimensional, there might be a lower dimensional submanifold. And it's interesting to figure out 
the different directions. So this would tell us something about nature, how it works, if we can find it out. Yeah? So the task of dimensionality reduction goes beyond just re compre compressing it so that we have fewer data. By finding like the relevant nonlinear axis, we might also learn something about nature's law. Okay? So that's a super interesting thing if we can do it well. There are many methods for nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So this is a list I copied from uh, the Wikipedia page. You see, I'm a big fan of Wikipedia. Um, so starting with Salmon's mapping from 1969, and I'm sure maybe other cultures or the Greeks, they have thought about similar things already and forgot to upload it to archive, okay? And so it's forgotten. But so many things have been invented over and over. And also here, there are a couple of methods which are very related, yeah? but usually each of them has some new cool idea. For example, kernel PCA is listed here. That is also about finding a submanifold. However, the directions are orthogonal in feature space, and last time we seen, it was a bit disappointing when you look at the directions in input space. It's not what you exactly want. And then there are many others, self-organizing maps, or also called Cohonen web maps, they are based on neural network. So that's a deep learning method, actually, right? Actually, I'm sure someone must have done it, but now with new computers, look at the paper again from um, Kohonen and see whether you can do something cool with it now with bigger data sets and maybe you can improve it now. Um, and there are many, many, many methods here. Here are two very famous ones, ISOMAP 2000 and locally linear embedding LLE 2000. Those are the two methods that we will look at today. Okay? Um, here are the papers. So the surprising thing about these things, if you can read the small print, they're both in the same issue of science. So they're both science papers, right? And that's often something very special. If you are a computer scientist or a mathematician, um, it's very hard to get into the nature journal or into science journal. So you really must have a method which is really very, very useful for a large group of people. And here, those two methods, they are both from the machine learning um, I would say machine learning department or let's say machine learning community, but from different labs. And they basically solve the same problem. So they're working on it in parallel with different ideas. So the isomap idea is really very different from the LLE idea. And both got some progress here and they were able to publish it at exactly the same time. And that gave both of them a lot of publicity, of course. So both of them were a highly cited paper. So the isomap paper is cited 15,000 times and the LLE paper even 17,000 times. And it also had a big splash on the careers of these researchers. I mean, now Josh Tenbaum, who's a MIT professor, I think in psychology and machine learning, so this kind of intersection of these areas, he has 85,000 citations now, but this is his biggest one. So the ISOMED paper is like his biggest contribution. And similar for, for John Langford. And um, also for Sam Rovais, who unfortunately died already 12 years ago, so this paper was having a super big impact on his um, citation count. And similar with Lawrence Saul. Why? I will tell you the reasons. So why were they so successful, these papers? They did the following. They were easy to use, the methods. So they wrote a really nice paper yeah, where they explained very well the methods. They made it really easy. They didn't write a paper where they started with lots of mathematics and then having some nebula bombing equations that is kind of confusing everyone and then you think, oh, these guys must be clever. No, it's not the case. It was easy to understand. So everybody knows what the method is doing and how it works and they made their code freely available. So every biologist could download the code and apply the method to their data. Yeah? And of course, Bing, that's another citation, right? So that's, that's very good. And there's almost no parameter tweaking. There's some parameter tweaking, but they really boiled down the method to their essentials. And they have some really nice examples at which we look next. And of course, they are very visible, right? By publishing in the science journal, you are very visible and everyone sees you. So if you are a PhD supervisor and your student is kind of, um, I don't know, let's say a biology student and she doesn't know what to do next with her data, then you as a supervisor, you read the science journal and there's this new method from MIT and the other lab, I think Caltech. And um, then 
they say, so this is a cool new method. Here's the code. You can just download it, apply it to your measurements, and let's see what we get out of it, whether we get also something interesting. Okay. So that's exactly what you should do with your work. Okay. Try to make it easy to use, easy to understand, make the code freely available, and show some inspiring examples, and then you're good to go having a great career in science. Okay. Just follow these steps. Very easy. Of course, not so easy. There's also luck involved, right? And of course, your Stenenbaum was already, I think, a super successful PhD student or maybe even postdoc when he did this. So he knew what he was doing and how to do it right. And similar, Sam Rovas was already very famous in the machine learning community. Okay, anyway, so let's look at the methods. Or let's look at the results first. So here's one result. That's an example from Josh Tenenbaum. Um, paper. So they generated some toy data and they did it together with some computer graphics people. So they said, okay, I think this is Michelangelo's face or something. Oh, I forgot. Some 3D computer graphics face where you have like the point cloud of a face and then there are some computer graphics guys who can render the image from different perspectives. So one axis is that one, turning the head like that. The other one is up and down and the other one is changing the lighting. So they are creating a data set in a thousand dimensions where they know actually there are only three axes that are relevant. There are only three numbers that describe every image. So we know that already because that's how we generated the data. And then they show with their method that their method will find these three axes. Okay? And you could imagine, so yeah, why, why does PCA not work on this data, right? So maybe they have a fancy method, but why does PCA on this method not work? I show you the reason. Take this image here on the top left. So it's looking to one side. Take the image on the other side, looking to the other side. Those are two points in 1,000 dimensions. For PCA now, we draw a straight line between the two images and interpolate between them. What images are we seeing in the middle? Does anyone know what we will see in the middle? Yeah? exact mix between the two. We see two faces, one looking to one side and one looking to the other side. So you cannot really linearly interpolate between two pictures. Only if you make a very small movement. So if you make a very small movement, it's fine. So it's locally linear, so there is some manifold. But if you take points that are further away, you will have some curvature here. Okay, And they are nicely getting this out. So they visualize the third dimension with this axis down here with this slider. So that is a lightning thing, which is yet another dimension which they couldn't print into the paper. Okay, so this is synthetic data, right? And it's reasonably complicated. And it's something, yeah, now you can apply it to fish, right? You can take videos of your fish in your biology lab and how the fish is swimming around or what movements they can do with their, what are they in English, do you think? the fins, for example, and then you could, for example, estimate the dimensionality of the space and then say, okay, probably there are three fins or maybe there are ten muscles or whatever, something that you couldn't trivially determine, right? So it's quite an amazing method. Here's another one. Of course, those are machine learning people, right? They know machine learning very well, so they use MNIST. That's the data set that is always nice. Some people complain, yeah, MNIST is so boring, everything works on MNIST. But that's not completely true. So at least if it's not working on MNIST, that's a very bad sign. So you better show some interesting results on MNIST. So that's reassuring. And here it's also interesting somewhat, right? So, so here he calls this axis bottom loop articulation and the one vertical one, the top arch articulation. And now this description of the axis, they are now made up by the authors, right? So the method is just putting all the tools into a two-dimensional grid somehow that makes sense. And then by, by looking at the data, they invent now this description. Of, key, of course, now today, in maybe in, in large language models, maybe even these descriptions could be automatically generated. So that could be interesting to run isomap on some data set and then let some large language model, by looking at the images or generate the description. That would be super fancy, right? But I don't think that exists yet. Here's another one. This is from the LLE paper. They were also quite creative. They also took video. Why is video so nice? Because it's inherently high dimensional. However, a video, a continuous video, suppose I take a camera, 
Now, my, okay, I can take my cell phone and I start the camera and I run from here to my office, then how, what's the dimensionali dimensionality of this manifold that I just recorded? Does anyone know? So it's a way going from here, yeah? It's a line, exactly. It's a line through this one-dimensional, it's a one-dimensional subspace of the 1,000-dimensional um, superspace, right? Because I'm running a line, right? And somehow it's also projected into this high-dimensional vector space, right? It's an interesting mapping that my camera then is doing. Yeah, similarly, I can also take my camera and I just move it around like this, so this would be also a one-dimensional line. Yeah? So what they did here is they took a video of a face and then the person was asked to show some funny facial expressions from laughing to whatever, putting out the tongue and some other Im expressions in here. And maybe they, maybe they, I don't know exactly what the instructions was, but probably something now smile and now look grumpy and now from grumpy take out the, the tongue and so on and so forth. And by this they kind of wanted to fill up the space with as many points as possible. And then they showed, again, for the same reason, of course, an interpolation doesn't work, right? Because then you see the teeth and you see the tongue at the same time, which doesn't make sense. So it's a curved space. And they are able to find a nice embedding for that one as well, OK? Uh, here's another one. Um, of course, you can also do it with words, right? So you can take words. And for example, you have a big data set of documents, say, a newspaper. And then you look at what words do co-occur with each other. And they get a similar vector. And then you can try to get a 2D representation of lots of words. And now this boxy thing here, I interpret it as, so this, this thing here is like looking from the top onto the A box. And the B part is looking like frontally to the B thing. So, but I'm not super sure what it is. Maybe it's, it's explained down here. Um, you can read it at home, yeah? I'm just saying also anything that can be represented in some high dimensional vector space can be kind of pushed down into lower dimension with these nonlinear embeddings. Okay, I find these examples really inspiring. So I want to use it on my data and then the method is successful. Question? Um, where is this in the slides? Oh, it's not yet in the slides. So I updated the slides. I like that example too, so I put it in here. Some things are missing. But if I don't upload, please tell me, then I, I, I forgot. So I, I should do it after the lecture. OK, so um, let's start with ISOMAP and LLE at the same time, because they use the same starting point. Yeah? They both use a neighborhood graph. A neighborhood graph is also called proximity graph sometimes. Okay? And it's basically defined as follows. So if we have some data matrix, x1 to xn, those are your frames from a video, or those are your pictures of Michelangelo, or those are your word vectors, or whatever. Then we make each of the data point a vertex, yeah? And we draw an edge between neighboring vertices, okay? So if points are close by, then we draw an edge, okay? So there are different recipes to do that. There's the so-called k-nearest neighbor graph, where we basically draw an edge to our k-nearest neighbors. OK, that's it, where k now is a parameter, OK? Um, ah, of course, we can ask the question, so what's happening for k equals 0? How many edges do we have for k equals 0? None. None, right. What happens for k equals n? Yeah? Four. Yeah, fully connected. Maybe even already for k equals n minus 1, everything is already fully connected, right? And somewhere in between, is an interesting structure, but we don't know exactly where, okay? It depends on how dense we sampled our points. Let me show you some code already here. So um, this is the notebook for today. Here's some proximity graph stuff. So um, let's take the Swiss roll right away. So this is a function which generates data from a Swiss roll, and I can plot it, okay? So this is a nice plot. And I also color it nicely. So look at the code to find out how I do this. Yeah, or I tell you. So there's an x, which is three-dimensional, and then there's a one-dimensional z, which is basically telling me the inside-out variable. Okay? And I also give it to give nice colors. And now we can have a nice graph. So here's the k and n graph for um, k equals 10. 
And as you can see, you get a nice graph which goes along the manifold, right? Now if I would increase it here, so let's increase it, then you see, ah, okay, so this is getting more dense here, so there are more shortcuts, kind of, but if I increase it even further, then suddenly we also get some more dramatic shortcuts over here, right? Especially these points at the end, they have not so many points close by, so the points here, they have enough points to the left and to the right. The points up here, they only have points in one direction, and that's why suddenly these points are also close, so we draw an edge, okay? And so in this case now, you can already imagine this is not so nice, right? If we have these shortcuts, that's bad probably for any algorithm that we want to apply to. So you see there's this parameter here to set. We need to find out. However, what happens if I make it very small? Let's say I make it three. Yeah, then you see that there are some parts that might be even alone. So this up here is a cluster. Can you see it? So there's a cluster of four points which like each other a lot, but they don't like anyone else. Okay, so they are isolated. So also that might not be such a good way to find this, to get the structure of the manifold. So recall, we are kind of trying to, so we have points sampled from a manifold, and now we are trying to do operations on the points to capture the structure of the manifold. So this k is too small. Let's take a larger one. So this kind of looks okay. So this is capturing the structure of the manifold, right? So it's kind of the lines are nicely going inside the manifold. Or with other words, if I have a point here and it has connection to its neighbors, those connections are all inside some linear subspace or in, inside the tangential space, okay? Okay, so far so good. So that's one option. Here's another one, the epsilon graph. And the epsilon graph is another, another way to do it. So we just have a little epsilon ball around our data points. And everyone who's in the epsilon ball is a, is a friend, is a neighbor. And that's yet another way to create a graph, okay? Again, we can see if epsilon is equal to zero, every point is super lonely, right? If epsilon is equal to infinity, everyone is connected with everyone, and we don't have the manifold structure kind of captured. So let's see what's happening here. So here's the epsilon graph implementation. Yeah, so you see there are also some holes in here now, so maybe I should increase it. Let's make it five. Okay, this this is this looks quite dense. This is nice. There are a couple of shortcuts over here which are not so good. So how about three? Yeah, maybe that one. So it's kind of capturing the, the one. And there are zillions of other proximity graphs, right? You can also define it with three points, if you, whatever, some triangle inequality, blah, blah, blah. Then you make a point, uh, a connection or something. Uh, so there are many options. Um, to create this graph. At the end, it doesn't matter. It should capture, it should go nicely along the manifold. So that's the point of the graph. Okay, so far so good. So which one to choose? The nice thing about k-nearest neighbor is it's kind of flexible because it's independent of the scaling, right? So if I have my data point, my Swiss roll, and I multiply all the points by 100, the k-nearest neighbor graph does not change at all because it's like scaling all the distances. However, my epsilon graph, is of course completely destroyed possibly if I scale everything by 100. I have to scale the epsilon as well by 100, okay? So the epsilon value kind of depends on the overall variance kind of, right? On the other hand, um, the k is also unclear, so it might also depend on the dimensionality and on some other factors what a good k is. So that's, those two are hyperparameters, okay, of all the methods that will follow. Good, now comes the basic idea of isomap. Okay, great, so I, I was talking about the ant, right, on the Swiss roll. So that was this, this poor little animal that's sitting here and it wants to get to the other side. So it has to go along the manifold, it cannot jump, and basically it could follow the graph, right? So if there's an edge, it will follow the edges. So the basic idea of isomap is now, let's calculate the distances of all points with each other, so all pairwise distances, but not the Euclidean ones, but along the manifold, or with other words, inside the graph, okay? And then, having this distant distance table, 
um, we use so-called multidimensional scaling to get an embedding. In multidimensional scaling, I will explain in detail how it works, why it works, and what you can do with it. But it will give you the embedding in the lower dimensions. Okay, so that is the basic idea of isomap. Here comes the basic idea of local linear embedding. So the, here, again, we start with this graph. And the idea is now to approximate the manifold locally, linearly. Okay, and what does it mean? It means for every data point, try to find a linear combination of the neighbors which matches this data point very well. Okay, this is the local linear description for every data point. And this very nicely is related to the mathematical definition of a manifold, right? We have a locally a linear subspace. Um, by the way, I don't know how, how Sam Rovice and colleagues got to the idea of that method, but if they were very good at mathematics, they knew the definition of a manifold, and this definition led to an algorithm, right? So they basically, this local linear subspace, they can formulate as an optimization problem, then they run their matrix differential calculus combined with Lagrange multiplier, blah, 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 and they got an eigenvalue problem. Great. And they got a nice new method. Yeah? So you see, sometimes things in mathematics might be super abstract and super useless and super, yeah, okay, the mathematician like it and they like to prove stuff, but sometimes the definitions are um, translatable into something actionable yeah, that you can turn into an algorithm. Okay, so here's the isomap algorithm, three steps, construct the neighborhood graphs, compute all pairs shortest path along the graph, and then apply multidimensional scaling to get the embedding. And here comes the LLE algorithm, we also construct a neighborhood graph, and then we express all data points as local linear combinations, that will be an optimization problem, and then we solve some other eigenvalue problem to get the low dimensional embedding. Okay, so those are the two methods, the steps of the two methods. And I think you have to implement them, I guess, in the exercises. Yeah. I hope you do. Okay, let's start with isomap. Um, so how do we construct the neighborhood graph now exactly? So we calculate all distances. That's the first step. And then for each point, we make a list of its neighbors. Okay, we could use K and N graph criterion, or we use the epsilon graph criterion. How do you apply the K and N graph criterion? Okay, in the distance matrix, you need to sort all the rows, right? You can sort them. But then this sorting you apply to the indices to get like the indices of your nearest neighbors, yeah? Or any other method that you like. And you ignore yourself because the distance to yourself is zero. So you're always your closest neighbor. With the epsilon graph, basically you are thresholding the distance matrix. And then you look for the non-zero entries, okay? So that's another possibility. Okay, great. So somehow we have list of neighbors for every point. And then we define the following weight matrix. For on the diagonal, we put zeros. For neighbors, we put the distance in here. And if we are not neighbors, we put infinity. Where infinity really means for the aunt, I'm here and I'm not, there's no direct connection to the other side. Yeah, you could also view it. So now I don't know whether you like this metaphor. So if there's a straight line, there's a bus connection, okay? So the arm can take the bus from one node to the other node. And it can only follow these bus connections here, yeah, with these straight lines. And however, it doesn't know if I'm here and I have to change my bus several times, I don't know how far it is. That's something that we compute in the next step, okay? Uh, here's a side question. So is this matrix W symmetric? That's a question for you. Okay, the diagonal is zero, great. And then I put something in if they are neighbors. Someone else? Yes? Yes, exactly. That is the exact answer. If we use epsilon balls, it will be symmetric, right? If I'm in your epsilon ball, you are in my epsilon ball. With k nearest neighbor, it could be Oh, you are my three best friends, but the three best friends um, under them, they are the three best friends among them. So I'm an outsider, okay? So it could be asymmetric. However, we can always easily symmetrize it if we want to. And as you see, here are so many arbitrary choices, symmetrization doesn't spoil the method, okay? Good, next we need to calculate all pairs shortest path on this matrix, right? And we don't 
invent a method ourselves, we look at this nice book. Do you know this book? Maybe some of you do. So this is a great book. And um, there's an algorithm called floyd Warshall algorithm. And again, here you see Josh Tenenbaum and colleagues, they paid attention in their algorithms 102 class, right? And maybe you think, oh, these flow problems and these, well, these graph algorithms, who cares for graph colorings? Who cares for flow problems? Why do I have to go through these advanced stuff? If you think about it long enough, you might find a new machine learning method, okay? That is super useful. So they did. Okay, so Floyd Warshall. The idea is now basically to um, uh, start with my matrix that I have, right? And that is like a schedule for my aunt, and it says, okay, when I'm at this point, there are these bus connections to the neighbors, and I don't know how far it is to the other connections. Okay, but luckily, um, I can now update my schedule by asking, update all lengths that I know already with respect to paths that go via x1. So there might be a connection from x2 to x3 via x1. So there's, so far there's infinity from x2 to x3, but in my first step I check all the paths that go via x1. And so if there will be a direct connection, then I will update this distance. So basically I'm, I'm having such a nice nested loop, and I'm checking, okay, my current connection that I have, yeah, how much time did it take? Is it maybe faster to go via k? And for all those that don't have a connection yet, I have infinity, so I will take the other one. Okay, so I check whether this is the case. Surprisingly, if you go through all of these, yeah, then you will have all pairs shortest paths calculated. Okay, there's some more thinking involved to really prove it, that you will catch all closest connections. But this is already quite expensive, right? It's O to the n cube. Yeah, so this is an expensive method. Yeah. Okay, by the way, this is an O to the n cube for isomap. I think this is the most expensive point here. The distance matrix costs n squared, um, calculating k nearest neighbor graphs, I think n squared log n, which is fewer, the n log n is for the sorting, and the n squared is because you have to do it for every data point. So the n cube here, I think, is the most expensive part. Um, you can have it a little bit at least faster in Python with NumPy. There are some nice functions like minimum, and you can have a vectorized version of that one. But it requires quite a bit of thinking to get to that solution and to check it that it's the same. I'm not sure whether you can further vectorize it with some tensor operations or something. I don't know. So if you can, uh, you can check with these uh, prune or L prune. You can check in Jupyter Notebook which one is faster. Yeah. There's also a MATLAB version. MATLAB is a nice programming language, but now we use Python. Okay, so here's yet another one. Okay, so here we go. Isomap, construct a neighborhood graph, step one. Okay, check, we know how to do this. Second step, compute all pairs shortest paths. Great, we paid attention in algorithms, so we know it's Floyd Warshall, and we just download it or we re-implement it. Now comes step three, apply multi-dimensional scaling transform, okay, into some embeddings, okay, and that is now the question, what is MDS, okay, so you don't know it yet, I will show you. So in a nutshell, MDS solves the following task, given a distance matrix, recover a data matrix that matches, okay, so that is the task. Um, I think, uh, I think I even had some pictures here on my screen, where are they? No, I removed them. Okay, too bad. So I show you in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, so this is a distance table, which I copied from an old roadmap. Okay, you know on these roadmaps, maybe you remember the times of roadmaps? So there was a time without GPS, and you had a roadmap in your car that you could open, and it was an instant on display, and it was never off, and it didn't take batteries and you can look for paths between two points. And typically, at the, at, on the last page, there was a distance table. And there you could look like, okay, I want to go from Aachen to Garmen, Garmisch-Partenkirchen. Okay, I think it's Garmisch-Partenkirchen, right? Garmisch-Partenkirchen, I guess. And then the table would say, okay, that will be 570 kilometers. Okay, 
and then whatever, I want to go from Salzburg to Berlin, and then the table would tell you how much it is. And actually, I was recently in Berlin, and there's this nice museum for communication, and they have really nice old distance tables from like 200, 300, 400 years ago, where it was about like um, Kutschen with horses, right? And they had these nice distance tables. And I took a picture, but I forgot where to put it. Um, where did I put it? Uh, well, whatever, I, I will look it up. I can show you next time. So, now what was MDS doing? Let's recall what MDS was doing. Given a distance matrix, recover a data matrix with those distances. Okay, that means if I have the distances for these cities here, I can recover the map, right? Because the data matrix will contain the locations. And that's quite amazing, I think, right? So you can take the distances, then you do some clever linear algebra, and out comes a map with the cities. Okay, and this is the result of MDS. And here, you, this might not be so nicely arranged yet, so here's Frankfurt an der Oder, Berlin, Hannover. I turned it around so that it looks good. And so here this really looks like a map. So there's Flensburg and there's Salzburg and Munich and all. Of course, this is Autobahn kilometers, right? So it might not be exactly precise because there might be some, well, let's say Rostock doesn't have an Autobahn, right? Then it's much too far away from the rest remaining cities than it actually is. Okay, um, but I think this is reasonably good because all these cities are connected via Autobahn, okay? So that's quite cool. Okay, so quite amazing. I'm sure now you want to, to learn how to get from the distance matrix to this super cool embedding. So I show you how to do it. We need linear algebra for this. I hope this doesn't come as a surprise. So let's first fix some notation. We have a data matrix and in this case, we assume column vectors for each data point. For the cities, we would have as many columns as there are cities, and we would have two coordinates, so D would be two, okay? Then we have a gram matrix. Okay, we've seen that one before. That's just a matrix that's defined by calculating all inner products. Okay, so that is the second player in this game here. And we have a covariance matrix. That's the outer product one. I think we don't need that one. I just put it here for completeness. So it's the other way around. And we have the squared distance matrix. Okay, the squared distance matrix is the one where we basically calculate pairwise distances and it's nicer to have them squared, right? Otherwise we would have a square root in here and that makes it more complicated. Okay, those are the things we need. And now the algorithm of multidimensional scaling goes, like, goes as follows. Given the distance matrix, calculate a gram matrix, and this is a tough step, how to get from the distance matrix to the gram matrix, but we can do it in one calculation, okay? Once we have the gram matrix, we basically take some kind of a matrix square root out of it, and we have our data matrix back. So we take the eigenvector decomposition, okay, and then we can define our data matrix. And you can recall, I think, yeah, if you calculate x transpose times x, you will end up with g, okay? And then the x will have the right properties and it will have the correct distances. Okay, so far so good. Notice, of course, the mean of the x is completely arbitrary, right? It doesn't matter whether we use coordinates with Greenwich mean being the zero, zero point, or whether having the zero point, whatever, in South Africa, or having the zero point in New Zealand. So that doesn't matter. The other thing is the scaling is, uh, the scaling is not arbitrary. The rotation is also arbitrary, right? Why? Because if I have my cities and they have certain distances, if I rotate all the cities, the distances stay the same. So now the difficult question that needs to be solved here is how can we calculate a gram matrix given the squared distances? And that's what we're going to do next. For this, we need a lemma, okay? So lemma means already, okay, so now comes the technicalities. However, these are already the boiled down technicalities. Please have a look at other descriptions of MDS. I think they don't use this matrix notation and we can take many shortcuts with it. So, first statement, the squared distances can be calculated from the gram matrix. That's the first statement, okay? Oh, okay, this looks like a fancy formula. I will explain in a second. 
This is already um, nice, right? Because now we have already an equation where the d appears and the g appears. Now, ideally, we can solve this equation for the g, right? If we can do it, then we are done. Let me tell you, we can't do it, but this is the basis to get the right formula. Okay, let's go through it step by step. Let's first understand the first line here. So this is just the connecting vector between xi and xj. And here we are calculating the length of that vector. So this is really the square distance between xi and xj. If I multiply this out, I'm having the inner product of x with itself, of xj with itself, and 2 times xi times xj. Okay. So now this is now rewritten as follows in matrix form. And I do this maybe on the board. OK, so we have um, dij is xi transpose plus xj transpose xj minus 2 times the mixed term, OK? And now I want to have a formula like that, but I want to use this trick. So the trick here is, OK, I can use the inner products to calculate distances, right? Which is good, because the gram matrix contains all these inner products. Now I want to have a formula for the d. So I want this was a scalar kind of formula. I'm having a scalar plus a scalar plus a scalar. And now I want to have something, a matrix plus a matrix plus a matrix, OK? Let's start with the simplest part. The simplest part is this thing back here, right? I can put all entries into a big matrix, and that is the gram matrix, OK? So minus 2 gram matrix. Those are all these entries. Now, what about this one? So that one, um, the i is the first index, so it's telling me something about the row, right? So ideally, at this location, I want to have the following matrix. I want to have in the first row x1, x1, and then again x1, x1, and so on, x1, x1, up to xn transpose xn. OK, so the entry in this first part here only depends on the row. What about the second one? The second one is the same, but transposed. OK, so that is the first one. Plus x, x1, x1 transpose in the second row, the same value, down to this one. And the last entry is xn. OK, so far so good. Everyone on the same page? Maybe. OK, so this is what's in the, in the matrices. So now, how do I get something like this? So remember, um, we had some tricks to do this, right? We can take this vector and multiply it with the row vector of ones. OK, so let's take a row vector of ones. So that's already something. That's a row vector of ones. And now I need to have all these entries here as a column vector. Yeah? Question? No, OK. So I need to have this thing as a column vector. OK? So what are these? Those are the diagonal entries of my G. So let's first extract the diagonal entries of the G. How do I get the diagonal entries? I dot multiply with the identity matrix. So what is this? This is Hadamard product. And it looks like, oh no, yet another product. But that's the simplest one. So that is basically component times component. So in um, Python code, that is the star. OK? And in MATLAB code, it would be the dot star. OK? So that is really takes the top left component, types the top left component here, and entry, and so on and so forth. So by multiplying the G matrix with the identity matrix, I'm getting a diagonal matrix where on the diagonal are just the terms that I want. OK? How do I get 
the terms from a diagonal matrix. So here's, here's a diagonal matrix. How do I turn this thing into a vector? So we know matrix vector, matrix times vector is a vector, right? So we just need to find the right vector. Any suggestions what we could use here? Yeah? The one vector, the one vector very good. So you are already a good programmer now in, in this kind of language here. Um, very well. So if I multiply a diagonal matrix with the one vector, I have row times column, it gives me the first entry. The second row times column, I get the second entry. Okay, so this thing is multiplied by the one vector, and that will be x1, x1 transpose, blah, blah, blah. Exactly what I want. This looks cumbersome, right? But once you have it here, I think it's OK. So because now we have another nice effect, right? Oh, this is the ones matrix, right? Which has some nice properties as well that we can use in a second. OK, so that is, um, that is basically this matrix now. This is this matrix. Now, can someone tell me the expression for that matrix? Yeah? Same, but, uh, right, transpose. So what do I get? Yeah, and if I do it, what, what do I get? What num, so what do I have to, what could I, I could copy it and put a transpose. Can you do it for me, the transposing thing here? Oh, one. Yes. One. Yeah. Right, it's just the other way around. OK, interesting, right? So here we are having, it's symmetric. Yeah. No, but you're right. In principle, we need it, but it's symmetric. So this operation is getting rid of everything that's not on the diagonal. So we end up with the diagonal matrix. And then the one is extracting it and making it a column vector. And then this one is a copy method, a copy that is kind of copying it like this. And here we do it the other way around from the left-hand side. Great. OK, so we have our fancy formula. OK, let's get back to the slides. I think that was the one that we had here. OK, so this is the formula that we have here. Um, that was the first statement. So the first statement is squared distances can be calculated from the Gram matrix. And we also have a fancy matrix expression for that one. Let's take the next one. So that's another lemma thing, something that will be useful later. Removing the mean from the ones matrix results in the zero matrix. OK, so let's look at this one. So here's the ones matrix, right? It's the one that appears here and there. That's why we need it. And removing the mean was just applying the centering matrix, right? That was the one identity minus this one. So identity just copies it, the ones matrix. And then we have here ones and ones and ones. And I did already some changing the brackets. Note, I cannot change the ordering, but I can change the brackets. And here I note the inner product of the ones vector with itself is a scalar, and it's equal to n. OK? So the n cancels out with Zn. And then we have the ones matrix minus the ones matrix, which is the zero, the zeros matrix. OK? The n by n zero matrix. OK? And with a similar reasoning, you can also do it from the left-hand side. So far, so good. So far, so good. So the curious thing is, here kind of we use the one vector like in an implementation style, right? So we use it the, the first one to extract the diagonal of a matrix, and the second one to do a, a copying operation. But now here we are using kind of its some mathematical properties of it. What to say? So we kind of chop this algorithm that we described here into two pieces. And one of the algorithm gets married with the other part of the expression here, right? And then we get something nice out of this. OK, here comes the third one. So now let's assume the mean of our data set is 0, right? The x can be anywhere, in any way, anywhere. 
So we can also assume that the mean is zero. So let's assume the mean is zero. That means that x times the one vector is the zero vector, right? That is mean zero. Okay, then we have the following. If we apply again x times h, yeah, we have already removed the zero as a mean, so the x doesn't change. So here I'm showing basically if the mean is already zero, applying the h again doesn't change anything. So that's the item potency. So let's do the similar thing for the gram matrix x transpose x. Let's apply the h from the left and from the right, and we see that the gram matrix does not change. Okay? That is the third technicality. So, and the key to understand now the next slide is that you are aware of that equation, of this property, and of that property. So, here's my theorem. So, assuming the mean of my data set is zero, then we can calculate the gram matrix as follows. We say minus a half centering matrix times the square distances times the centering matrix. Okay? And this is really non-trivial that you can do this. So let's look at the proof. The proof is now super simple. We just take the equation that we had up here and we multiply from the left and from the right an h to it. Okay? So that's why I put an h left and right of the d. And let's see what's happening to all these expressions. So this was just copying it. So this was this weird thing that we've just had on the board. So here I'm looking on the term once matrix trying to be centered. And it turns out it's the zero matrix. So the first term disappears. Here the H also gets called on the ones matrix. So the second term is also zero. And at the end, we've seen that for center data, H times G is equal to G. So we simplified this at H times D times H is equal to minus 2G. Okay? And with that, we have the proof up here. So we had to go through some difficult notations here, but then the result was really simple at the end. Okay, great. So now we have the full method. So multidimensional scaling is really just doing calculate the distances, or we have the distances, and then we calculate the gram matrix like that, take the matrix square root, and we are done. Okay? Let's have a look at the code, whether that's really true, that that's the solution. I think here's an implementation of the MDS. Okay, here are my cities. Oh, do you have to implement it as well? Oh, let's have a look at the code. So that's really simple now. Uh, how can I open this one? I think. Ah, but then you will see all the solutions. No, I don't show you. Okay, no, that's a bad idea. Okay, trust me, these three steps, that's like code. It's like code already, okay? Again, you want to be efficient. You can implement the centering operation, of course, by removing the mean of the distance matrix, row-wise and column-wise. OK? And that's it. OK. So far, so good. Any questions about multidimensional scaling? If not, let's flip back to isomap. Now we have all steps, right? So we have, we construct a neighborhood graph. We compute with Floyd Warshall all pairs shortest paths. And then we apply multidimensional scaling. And that's it. So let me show you some little demo code here. So where do we have it? OK, so here's the isomap thing. Here I'm playing around with Floyd Warshall. I also have it in there, so I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm really asking in the exercises. So if there's something uh, that you need that is not directly the answer, put it into the chat and we can give you the function. But the pseudocode is also in the slides. So typically it's a good idea to try it yourself. Yeah? Uh, maybe for the implementation of these things, let me show you um, how I would do it. So I would typically take some little test code. So here's test code. So I take a very simple data set. So it's just a 1 by 10 matrix. So it's just scalars. And the entries are just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And those are my 10 data points. So it's a row vector in this case, a capital X. And then the first test is, please calculate all distances of Z1 like this. And you can easily check that the distances are correctly calculated, right? 
the distances to, it, to yourself is zero, the distance to your immediate neighbor is one, to either side, to the other one is two, three, and so forth. And we see distances, okay, it's calculating the distances not squared. Yeah, that's important for the method, for the MDS method. And then I can also ask, so what is now the K and N graph on this distance matrix? Let's say two neighbors. And then you just, by looking at it, you see that the implementation is right, at least in this simple example. You see that the first point has the first and the second point as a neighbor, and everyone else just is left and is right neighbor. And you, you can increase and ask for four neighbors, and so on and so forth. You can look at the epsilon graph with epsilon 0 0.5, everyone is alone, epsilon being equal to 1.1. And so those are the typical steps that you need to do. And similarly, you, you, can, find, you can define a very small example for Floyd Warshall, yeah? and then run the code on a very small example and check whether you get the right solution. Or I think there's also a, a, a graph in this Corman Leisurezen book. I think there's also a little toy example. You can type in those numbers and see whether you get the same solution as they got in their book. OK, so let's look at isomap. So where is it? I lost some, some menu here, up here. So where is it? Isomap. OK, here's isomap. Ah, oh yeah, OK, so here's my Floyd Warshall test, also on the same data set. And it's an example that I can fully understand, right? And so the Floyd Warshall is here applied on this, on this weight matrices. And it has number two. I forgot what the two is. What is this two? Oh, I forgot. I cannot check now, because then you will see the code. OK, but anyway, it's important to make these little demos for yourself, yeah, so that you can trust your code. Because isomap is then relying on it, right? And if the Floyd Washer code is wrong, you will only get garbage out of it. OK, so uh, I can only show you now the answer here. And so this is the answer. So this is the nice graph. Um, and then this is the output, the two-dimensional embedding where the colors are purely for visualization here, so that we know that everything went fine. Let's make it in such a way that it breaks. So let's increase the number of neighbors, OK? So let's have some shortcuts here. Ah, no shortcuts yet. So let's take even more points, uh, more neighbors. Apps. Any shortcuts? Still no shortcuts. So hmm, let's take 100 neighbors. OK, now we get some shortcuts. Now, what would you expect from the isomap? Of course, the isomap doesn't work anymore, and you get something like this. OK, so this is now a compromise. The blue stuff tries to be close to the yellow one, right? Why? Because there are shortcuts from the yellow one to this pink stuff, OK? So this embedding really tries to match it as well as possible. However, maybe in three dimensions, the match would be, of course, nicer. So in three dimensions, I guess the embedding will be something like this. Actually, that's a nice example. Let's try it. So let's say my embedding dimension is also three. Let's see what the thing is spitting out here. Oh, but the plot is now. So it is kind of the spiral thing. How can I plot it in 3D? OK, let's try this. I do plot graph. 3D, and now I'm taking the Ys, OK, my embedded data points. I can use the graph, sure, why not? It's a ways to calculate it again, but computers are fast. So let's look at the 3D plot and see. So where is it? There it comes, OK. OK, so this is the embedding. And you see it did some distortion. But it tried to keep the neighborhood relationships where we have the shortcuts. Right? So you see that it breaks. What does it mean for you being a physicist, a biologist, a chemist, or a social scientist, or whatever, who like to run isomap? You have to be careful with the parameters. Okay? Can you predict whether something goes wrong? Um, yes, I think so. But I'm not sure in the multidimensional scaling how to figure it out. I guess it's about how you can look in the, in the multidimensional scaling. Um, where are we? Here. 
We are calculating the eigenvector decomposition here. And by looking at the eigenvalues, it will tell you something about the dimensionalities that are necessary. So this is now a little bit advanced. But suppose there is a nice two-dimensional embedding. It will mean that there are only two eigenvalues which are non-zero. And most of them are zero. However, if there's no nice two-dimensional embedding, but only a three or high-dimensional embedding, then as many eigenvalues will be positive, OK, and non-zero. So you can drill deeper and make it a nicer method. So far, so good. Any questions about isomap? Not really. OK, let's go on with LLE. So that is the other method, and it works like this. So here we are in a high dimensional space noted by these axes here, right? So it has these five or four feet. Here we are in high dimensional space, and down here we are in lower dimensional space. So in local LLE, you first also select your neighbors using k nearest neighbors or using epsilon graph or using whatever graph you like. Then you try to reconstruct the xi as a linear combination of its neighbors. So you are looking for the linear weights and you store them. And then you are trying to find a lower dimensional embedding where these weights still hold, where they still work. So from here to here, you are estimating w's. And then you keep the w's, and they keep the information. And then you reconstruct y's down here, OK? Like in LLE, in isomap it was, you start with the data, and you calculate a big distance matrix along the manifold. So the distance matrix contains all information, and then you get the embedding. Here you are taking the weights, and they are the intermediate representation. And then you get the embedding, OK? So here's a sketch. So we first find the neighbors, step one. Step two is find weights that locally reconstruct the data linearly. So basically, we are trying to find Wij, a matrix like that, such that if I take a linear combination of other points, I get my point xi, where my Wij is 0 if xj is not a neighbor of xi. So I'm only allowed to use my neighbors for the linear reconstruction. OK, and as you can guess, this is an optimization problem in W, in matrix W. OK? When you have the W, you fix it, and then you are looking for the embedding. On the previous slide, it was called Y. I'm calling it here Z, yeah, as I did before. Good. Let's first find the weight, step one. So we have a constraint optimization problem. So here's my, here's my optimization problem. Reconstruct the fit very well. Subject to the summation of all weights should be 1. And in such a way that my neighbors are all zero, basic, uh, are all non-zero, and my neighbors are 0. So I didn't put it here. Maybe I should put it here as well. So I should put here another equation or another statement saying all your non-neighbors, for all your non-neighbors, the wij must be equal to 0. However, the, the nice thing of this problem is it can be solved separately for all i. So we can look at a simpler problem. For a single data point, I can ask the question, given your neighbors, and now they got names, eta j, yeah, those are the neighbors among the x, find wj's that sum up to 1, such that the reconstruction is very nice. OK, so you can iterate. You don't have to solve it for the matrix simultaneously. You can do it for every data point separately. OK, um, let's rewrite the objective a little bit. So this is the starting point. And now, since the summation of the wj should be equal to 1, we can put it in front of the x, OK, and drag the x into the summation, and then drag out the summation and the w. So we get the summation of the w of x minus the eta j. Or with other words, draw the connecting vectors to your neighbors, to your friends, yeah? And then find a linear combination that you get a 0. So that's the same thing. OK? Then this can be written out. So this can be written out as the double summation. So it's the, the summation squared. Yeah, I said, let me write it down on the board so that it's really simple, actually. But so if you have something like this, uh, eta j. Eta i. So this is 
the starting point, right? And how do we do that? We always take the inner product, so we will have the summation of i that is the first factor transpose times summation of the i w i x minus eta i. And now if we want to transform it, we typically give one of the summations a different variable, gebundene umbenennung. So this one, and then basically we can drag out the summation signs, we can drag out the weights, and we will end up with something in between. So we will get summation i and j, w i, and then we get x minus eta i transpose x minus eta j times wj. I just put it to the outside. It's a scalar. You can put it anywhere. Okay? So this is going from here to there. Fine. Now these are basically can be put on a big matrix, right? So there's a j and a k. So this is the j k's entry of a matrix. And we can rewrite the whole equation as some outer, now what is it called, some, lin some quadratic form, right? So this is a quadratic form in terms of w. Let's write down the Lagrangian. So, and don't worry, this is super short, and we don't derive the dual. So we basically have our objective function minus our constraint, which is just the one vector times w minus one. So that is just this constraint up here, okay? So, if we now do matrix differential calculus, we get as a derivative this part here that we can set to zero, and if we set it to zero, we get a formula for the w, okay? Or the other way around, you could also say c times w is equal to lambda times one, solve it for w, and you use this lin alg solve algorithm if you implement it. Okay, still the question is now, how do I choose the lambda? Any ideas how to do it? What is lambda? How should it be chosen? Can I calculate it? It's not so easy. Oh, it is easy, but only if you know how to do it. So we have this constraint. The summation of the w should be equal to 1. And the lambda is scaling all of these guys. So we choose the lambda such that the summation of the w is equal to 1. That's it. So the lambda is just a rescaling, okay? So we solve c times w being equal to 1 with lin alg dot sol, for example, and then we rescale the w such it sums up to 1, okay? Okay, so here's the summary. For a single data point, we find its nearest neighbors. We calculate a so-called local covariance matrix, which I find confusing because it's a local gram matrix somehow, right? But in the LLE paper, Sam Rovice and colleagues call it the local covariance matrix. And they are super clever. They are more clever than I am. So I trust them that this thing is also called the local covariance matrix. However, I think it's the other way around. Um, but probably it doesn't matter very much. As we see, the inner product matrix, gram matrix, and the outer product matrix, they share the same eigenvalues. And they also share the same eigenvector structure somehow, so you can translate one into the other. So somehow the information in this inner product matrix has all information there is also in the local covariance matrix. So maybe that's why you can call it a covariance matrix, because it contains all the relevant information. Okay, and then we calculate the W. Okay, so far so good. Let's put the W all into a big matrix. So now we calculated it for our data point xi, and this will fill the ith column of our matrix w, where we put lots of zeros for our non-neighbors, and then for our neighboring entries, we put the coefficients in there that we just calculated in the previous step. Okay? So I can do this for all data point, collect all these, these short w vectors, maybe they have length k, if I use k nearest neighbor, yeah? and then I need to put it into a big matrix so that I have a nice big matrix W, which summarizes everything. So far, so good. Next step, finding the embedding, okay? Yet another optimization problem. So 
This time I'm optimizing over y. Okay, I'm looking for a big matrix y such that the ith column can be written as a linear combination of certain other yj's, where the wij has zeros for the non-neighbors in x space. Yeah, so also the yj's that do not correspond to points to neighbors in x space they are ignored, and for the others I have the right weight. Um, Again, the y's are kind of arbitrary, right? I can shift them around arbitrarily. The mean is, can be assumed to be zero. And I can also assume some identity, the covariance to be identity. But I'm not sure about this one here. So this one I find a bit questionable, right? So that's kind of unclear because it's like rescaling axis. So I'm not sure about that one. I need to check it. So now this problem here can be also written in a nice fashion. It could be written as the trace of y m y. So that is a bit more involved. I hope you trust me on that one. So if you multiply out this product here, the first term with itself is the term for the identity. Then you have some terms where you multiply the y with the summation. So the w appears once, and the y appears twice. So that's where the w transpose appears. And a similar one for the w itself. And then you have a term where this term is multiplied with itself. And that is generating a w times w transpose. So if you plug this m into this, and you redo the matrix matrix multiplication and write out the summation signs, you will end up with this expression up here. Okay. The steps are always approximately the same. So, and this optimization problem now can be solved. I don't show you exactly how, but it is very related to a simultaneous PCA problem, which I put into the appendix of the PCA section. But it can be shown that this is basically solved by the eigenvectors with the smallest eigenvalues. That's a bit confusing, right? Why the smallest eigenvalues? That's kind of strange. I also find it strange, but um, that's how it is. So that's just how it is. M reason might be I'm minimizing this expression. So I'm minimizing the y times m times y transpose. So I'm looking for the smallest eigenvalue, right? We've seen some in some other lecture that this expression y times the matrix times y that corresponds to the value of the eigenvalue. And if I minimize it, I'm looking for the smallest one. So that's part of the reason. But we don't go into too much detail here. I think we had already quite a bit of detail. OK, so here's the algorithm. And I copied it from Sam Rovai's page. And even though he, I think he died 12 years ago, um, the page is still there. And I copy and pasted the details. Because sometimes the details are like important. So from my initial understanding of LLE, I was not able to implement it. But then I looked at Sam Rovai's page, page, and there were the missing details, the stuff that I was missing. Okay. So this typewriter stuff is copied from his page. Um, there's some some technicality at the end. So you create this matrix, as I said before. This is this big matrix M. And then you find the bottom d plus 1 eigenvectors of this matrix. Yeah? They are corresponding to the d plus 1 smallest eigenvalues. Now, what was d? d was the embedding dimension. So if you want to have two dimensions in your embedding, you need to calculate three eigenvectors. The, the interesting thing is one can show that for this matrix M, yeah, the bottom eigenvector is just only once. And that is the one that you discard. It is eigenvalue 0, OK? And you need the second smallest and the third smallest. But those are technicalities which, um, I don't know, I only got to because I was able to copy the pseudocode here. So far, so good. Now you could ask, so what about the shootout between LLE and isomap? Which one is better? Which one should I use? Let's look at the code. So here's my implementation of LLE. And this is here in, I think you don't have to do it. So this is the implement. I think I maybe translated his code from MATLAB to Python or something. So there are some tricks involved. For example, if the number of neighbors is larger than the embedding dimension, 
we need to regularize, so there are some technicalities, like finding small eigenvalues is numerically maybe something that can be a bit challenging. And so he put it already all in here. So you have to add something to the diagonal, so some technical tricks to make it work. OK? OK, so far so good. Let's look at the result. So this is a, what is it, a 2D example? No. So let me run this code again. OK, why do I get a 2D plot? Oh, here it is. OK, so this is also the nice manifold. And then the embedding looks like that one. And you can say, ah, this doesn't look so nice as the isomap one. So it's a bit more squashed together. So there are some difficulty here really spreading it out. Um, I'm sure if Sam Rovice would run it, he knows how to tweak it. I don't know. So there are, there are some tricks to make it really look nice. But if you just follow the recipe, sometimes you get that one. It has to do with how we sample the manifold. So if you, for example, if I sample it like in a very simple fashion, having a uniform distribution for the angle, for example, then we have many more points inside than outside, right? Because there the angle distance is larger. So there are some tricks how to sample it right so that at the end it looks nice, right? But I, I didn't spend enough time to figure it out. So I would say, for me, the isomap method is somewhat simpler to do. Yeah? So that is the one that I think is um, easier to handle. Um, however, also, I mean, here we, we get right away a very nice embedding, which really spreads out. OK? However, there are, might be extensions, and it created a lot of follow-up work also in the machine learning community. So maybe there's also an improved version for the LLE. OK, so far so good. That's LLE. So I'm, now I say, do you want to see another method? Yay! Hurrah. Yeah, we still have five minutes, so I show you another method, whether you want or not. OK? So this is the maximum variance unfolding idea. Very nice idea. You unfold the manifold. OK, I can imagine what that means. It means unfolding, exactly what I want in such a way that the local distances are kept constant, and then maximize the variance. So like having my samples here, I put little strings between neighboring points, and then I just drag it like this. OK? So that is maximum variance unfolding. So far, so good. This is your intuition. Now, how would you approach it? You would write down a mathematical optimization problem, and then go to the mathematics department to solve it. And that's how they did it. OK? So, Ah, OK, here comes the, the sketch. We construct a neighborhood graph, and then you solve a semi-definite programming problem. Now, semi-definite programming, that's yet a step more advanced than this constrained stuff that we've seen. But there are solvers for this one, too. OK, so let's first write down the optimization problem. We want to maximize the variance while keeping the local distances constant. So let's start with keeping the local distances constant. So for my embedded data points y, I want to have the same distances as I have in my higher dimensional space for the case that xi and xj are neighbors. OK, so this is keeping the local distances constant. Overall, I say, OK, the location doesn't matter, so my mean should be 0. OK, now what do I have to maximize in order to maximize the variance? This I'm doing by maximizing pairwise distances all along the way, OK? So that is a way to um, calculate the variances here. Now I'm just wondering, you might know this. So this formula is a bit strange, right? So why is this the variance, right? So you take every pair of data points and you calculate the distance. Why is an average on that one the, the variance? For that one, I think there's a nice formula. So you know the variance can be written um, like this to be the expected distance to the mean, right? The expected squared distance to the mean, where this is a constant. So this is not random anymore, right? So the e is taking care of that random variable and calculating a scalar. So the, ex the expectation here is only over this x, OK? This can be rewritten as the expectation of x squared minus 
the expectation of x squared. OK? So that's some exercise, I think, that you usually do in Wahrscheinlichkeitstheory, maybe, or maybe even in some other lecture. However, there's another way to do this. So you can also take pairwise distances. So um, how can I write it? Um, OK, let's say x and y coming from the same distribution. OK, now I'm making this up. So there's a certain probability this is garbage what I'm writing down here. Let's hope for the best. So they're having the same distribution. They will have the same mean. They will have the same variance. And now I could also say, look at the square distance between the two. So basically take samples from one variable and take samples from the other variable and then look at them. And typically we have something like my first data point is coming from this distribution, my second data point is coming from that distribution, and then it's more looking like x1 and x2. Yeah, so that is another way to measure variance. Intuitively it makes sense. And I think one can write it more nice. I mean, this is already written nicely. This is not written so nicely. But the square distances between data points are also telling us basically the variance. Good, so far so good. Unfortunately, this is very tough to solve. So this cannot be solved so easily. Why? OK, this is a quadratic function. This is OK. It's convex, maybe, in y. So I can minimize or maximize it. That's OK. However, this is a quadratic constraint, OK? And why are quadratic constraints problematic? They are problematic because, uh, let's say, this is the objective that you want to minimize. So this is the some squared function that I'm trying to minimize. So I'm trying to get to the minimum down here. Typically, we have linear constraints. And then with the linear constraints, yeah, OK, I can go along this one and then stop right here. So that's possible. However, a nonlinear constraint could be something like you have to be on this circle. And now you should minimize. So the circle could be, unfortunately, looking like, like this. So find the minimum of one function being constrained to be on this circle. The problem here is always that you need to compare this point to that point. So they are both locally minimal, but it's very hard to compare them. Because I cannot just say, OK, I'm going along and find something else. Now you say, but those are only two points. So where's the problem? The problem is, once we are in r to the n, such constraint will generate 2 to the n candidate local optima that you need to compare. So that's why nonlinear constraints are a problem. Yeah? And properties and p complete or something. But I'm making this up. Um, so that is a tough problem to solve because of this nonlinear constraint here. So let's rewrite this problem using the gram matrix G. And that first sounds a bit crazy, right? Um, Let's think about the dimensionality. Let's say my y's are two by a two-dimensional embedding. So the, the capital Y is a two by 1,000 matrix. So here I would have to optimize over 2,000 numbers, right? 2,000 scalars, all the entries of my matrix Y. If I now optimize over my gram matrix, I suddenly have to optimize over 1,000 by 1,000 points, uh, scalars, which is much more expensive. However, surprisingly, it will solve this super tough optimization problem. So you pay a price, but then you solve a super nonlinear optimization problem, which is really tough. OK, I spare you the details, maybe. So we can rewrite as our usual, using our usual tricks that we've seen already 10 times. And then we can rewrite the distances using the entries of the gram matrix. We know this trick already, right? And then we can rewrite the objective function, surprisingly, at the end as 2n times the trace of g. OK. I think you trust me on that one that this is possible. right? It's surprising, but it is possible that you can do it. Um, and we assume some other things, blah, using similar tricks as before. And oh, this is the, oh, this is the proof how to do it. OK, fine. And after doing that, 
we can rewrite our optimization problem now in terms of a matrix G. So instead of maximizing the variance, now we maximize the trace of G, yeah, such that the distances are kept. So this is a different way to write the distances of the Y. Okay, so the local distances are kept. However, now the constraint is linear, right? Before the constraint was quadratic because the Y was squared. When we take the entries of the gram matrix and we say we optimize over those, suddenly the constraint gets um, linear. And then there's some other constraint, and the most interesting one is the back one where we have these, like these curved greater sign. So the curved greater sign means that the G should be positive semi-definite. Okay? And this is a strange side condition, right? That looks a bit difficult to handle. However, this is one from the canon of some standard optimization problems for which you can just download solvers in Fortran. Okay? And it's called semi-definite programming. Because you are optimizing over the trace of a matrix, that should be positive semi-definite. That's why it's called semi-definite program. And there is a solution, of course, for that one. Okay? Um, so far, so good. So this can be solved. However, it is kind of expensive when you have lots of data points. Yeah? Then you don't want to do it. Nonetheless, it's kind of funny that you can do it. So it's kind of really showing you that a fancy optimization method where the mathematicians might go wild. Wow, we solved it. We can now do semi-definite programming. But then who cares, right? What can you do with it? Now you can do something with it, right? I mean, of course, the mathematician had probably already application in mind. But maximum variance and folding is yet another application. OK, so that is maximum variance unfolding it. I'm not saying more about it. OK, so the last slide where you need to pay attention is, now suppose I run isomap, LLE, or whatever. Maybe your great new method that you came up with. And we have now the combination of a data set and of embeddings. Now, how can I map new points? OK, so I, in uh, PCA, it's nice, right? In PCA, I have a new point, and I can just project it onto my lower dimensional space, or I can take my lower dimensional space and I can project it up again and look at eigenfaces or at other things. So how do I do it here? So here you do it as follows. For your new test point, you find the neighbors in your training data set. Let's call this one the training data set. Okay? And then you look at the linear combination of these neighbors. So you try to express yourself as a linear combination of your neighbors. And then you just map yourself onto Z star, which is now the linear combination of the in de embedded data points. And that's it. So why is that a, a good idea? Because it nicely matches the idea of a manifold, right? Which says, locally, it's linear. And locally, I can, I can approximate my data points linearly with its neighbors. OK, so it's exactly implementing this idea. And of course, you can also do it the other way around. Good. So, summary of today. So, we learned many fancy words like manifold and Swiss roll, proximity graph, and all these things, and semi definite programming. And I hope it inspired you that the methods are super useful and also that you are able to understand every detail of the method for the implementation. And ideally, that you come up with your own ideas and follow the steps of these giants to write your first science paper or nature paper. Okay? So that's it for today. Thanks a lot. And I see you on Monday.